Christmas? Yeah? Hope so. How many people were here for the, the New Year's Eve? None? Nobody? Y'all missed it. It was good. We had a lot of fun. There was a lot of music, a lot of time together. There was, there was quite a few folks here. Did I say New Year's Eve? Yeah, there you go. I love starting off like that. Let me try that again. How about Christmas Eve? All right. <laughs> yeah, well, thanks for keeping me in line. I appreciate that. But New Year's Eve is coming up, right? Lord willing. I don't think we're going to have any kind of a service here, though, New Year's Eve. So don't come up here New Year's Eve. All right, well, I'm glad you guys are here. As Ruth said, it's always, it's always great to get together and, and, and worship and sing and, and fellowship, so I really appreciate seeing all of you. We got a lot of that white stuff yesterday, didn't we? Woo! Last time I talked about snow, somebody booed me. <laughs> well, let's get started today. You know, we're going we're gonna to talk about several things, but what I want to start with is over the last three weeks, Mark has been talking about how do we handle anxiety, especially this time of the year, but, but not only this time of the year, throughout the year. And he, he talked about if we want to have true peace, there's a place to go, there's a person to go to. And he has this, this great acronym that, that has really been very helpful for me, and that's STOP. Do you all remember that? Remember, it means surrender, trust, obey, and praise. And Mark said that anytime you find yourself in this, in this, this place of anxiety, of, of anxious, anxiousness, well, then just stop. Now, I like that because I'm, I'm kind of simple. As you can tell, I usually don't know what day I am. You know, I'm trying to move too far into the future. So sometimes anxieties or something like that will come up. And when I catch myself there, it's, it's easy for me to remember something like stop, you know? Because then it, then it gives me that moment of pause where I can step back and I'm like, okay, no, wait a minute, I'm stopping. Well, that's not that easy. Well, what do I have to do if I'm gonna stop? Well, I'm gonna surrender. Well, that's okay. That's not that easy. Well, how do I do that? Well, I do that by trusting. Okay, well, then I need to be obedient. And praise, and then most of all, I need to remember who it is that is really on the throne, who it is that is sovereign, who it is that, that I'm trusting, and that's Jesus Christ. That's something that we need to remember. That's, uh, that's something that we need to remember. He also cited a Psalms, and I want to read that this morning, Psalms 127, 1 through 2. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It is in vain that you rise up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil, for he gives to his beloved sleep. And Mark used a play on that, and he called it eating rotten fruitcake. You know, and anxious toil, I, I, that, that, that's a really good word picture for me anyway, or eating rotten fruitcake. You know, when we, when we get caught up in our anxieties and we start trying to control things ourselves, or if we start trying to, to, to hang on to the outcome of things, well, we, we're outside of what we were designed to be. We, we're going way outside of what we have any control over. Mark taught that there was two words that we really needed to delicately balance, and that's being responsible and fulfilling our responsibilities. We do have responsibilities, don't we? We have a responsibility. We have a responsibility to parent. We have a responsibility to get up and to work. We have responsibilities to abide in his love and ab abide in his love and his word and his, and his, in him. We have responsibilities, but we're not responsible for the outcome. How many people here has either done this themselves or heard of someone that planned something and it came out exactly the way you had it planned. See, the problem with that is, is that you're reaching into the future, and that's not ours. You're trying to control the infinite variables of a universe that, that you didn't speak into existence. 
right? So there is a difference between being responsible and fulfilling your responsibilities, and we need to be able to delicately balance that. And that's an important principle to remember as we go through our study this morning. I want you to remember that that there's a difference. God is the one that is ultimately responsible for the outcome. Because we're gonna talk about some of our responsibilities today. We're gonna talk about being the Lord's steward today. So I wanna introduce to you, if you haven't read it already, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter four, that's where we're gonna, that's our main verse today. Let me get kind of settled up here. And Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter four, verses one through two, he writes, this is how one should regard us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found faithful. Today we're gonna to explore two components of that passage. We're gonna, we're gonna explore being a servant of Christ and being a steward of the mysteries of God. Let's pray. Father, Lord, thank you so much that you are on the throne. Lord, thank you for your love, your mercy, your grace. Father, thank you that you are sovereign. Thank you that you are the beginner and the end. You are everything. Lord, help us to remember who you are at all times. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would be with us during this time, Father, that only your words would come through. Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit would completely encompass this entire area, Father, that you would speak to our hearts. It's only you, Lord, that can lead us into understanding. So I pray and I humbly submit to you at this point. In Jesus' name, amen. So this morning, the first phrase I wanna look at is what does it mean to be a servant of Christ? What does that mean? And, and Mark, I know, is taught on this and it, and, and a servant isn't an unfamiliar word for us, okay? But I wanna go to the Greek on this. What word did Paul use? And, and it's an unusual word. It's not one that, that he typically uses or that we typically see in the New Testament. It's huperetes. That's the word for servant in this, uh, in this particular passage. And it means under oarsman, you know, or an under rower. I've heard it also used as a third level galley slave. And on board ships, you know, you have, you have the top deck, you know, we call that the weather deck. And then you have decks that are down below that that goes into the bows, if you with, wish, of, of the ship. Well, an under rower or an under oarsman is one of those folks that is down on the lower decks. Okay, and that's an interesting word that, that, that Paul uses. Now, you, it's something to pick up right off the bat that someone that is an under rower is not responsible for where the ship is going. There's, there's no way for an under rower to have any real effect on the outcome. The master says row and the under rower rows. He says row faster and he rows faster. He says stop and he stops. That's the word that, that Paul used here. There's a couple of other words that, that we've talked about here that doulos, which is by and large the most common word that is translated as servant. It's literally means slave. And then there's another word that you guys are familiar with and it's diakonos, which is the word that we get the word deacon from. And it means to attend or to run an errand. Okay, so we have three different words and the significance between the words are not necessarily that large because it all means that, that we are serving someone else. That's what a servant is. But what I like about this, this picture is that you get three different ideas or three different visions of what a servant is. An under rower, one that runs errands, a slave. And we're to be servants of Christ. And it's important, again, to, we're not responsible for the outcome, but we do have a responsibility here. Jesus gave us several examples, one in John 13, where he was up in the upper room having a meal with his disciples. Y'all wouldn't know the story. He ended up washing their feet, you know? Now, if there was ever a person 
that should never have to wash anybody's feet or serve in that capacity would be Jesus Christ. Wouldn't you agree? He is the king. He is God Almighty. Mark talked about that on, on Christmas Eve. Those different names, Everlasting Father, Mighty God, Wonderful Counselor, right? But he did it because he wanted to demonstrate that a servant lives a life of humility, a humble life. In that culture, it's customary for somebody to come in, especially the guest of honor, to have their feet washed. Marcus talked about this. He said they were probably dung covered, certainly very dirty. Typically, the, the lesser of the servants would be the one that would go in there and wash people's feet. It certainly wouldn't have been the owner of the house, and even more so, it wouldn't have been the guest of honor who Christ was, and yet he did that. But there's an even more significant place that Jesus shows us in his word of his servanthood. And I want to explore that one just a little bit. Philippians chapter 2, verses 7 through 8, speaking of Jesus, but emptied himself. Jesus emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, doulos, servant, slave. Being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. You see, Christ gave examples over and over again, but, but never more so in going to the cross. And there's some important words in there. Doulos is one, he was a servant, he was acting as a servant, all right, giving us that example, but he was obedient. He was found faithful. Now, if you've trusted in Christ this morning, you've experienced the greatest blessing that could ever happen. You've been saved. If had he not been obedient, there'd be a different story, wouldn't there? A life, a servant's life is a life demonstrated humbly. Paul is telling us in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 that we are to be servants of Christ. In fact, if you, if you remember, it said they should regard us as servants of Christ. Now, how does somebody, how would you regard someone as something? How would you be able to tell? I want you to think about that for a moment as we go on. How would you be able to tell if someone was a servant or if someone was anything? How do you know? How do you know what they are? What tips you off? What, what clues gives you insight into who they are and what they, what they are? The other phrase we're going to explore is stewards of the mysteries of God. And that word for steward is an interesting one. I'm going to try to pronounce this. Okonomos. Okay, Okonomos. And it means steward, literally, or manager. But there's a couple of other definitions that I want to bring in just to give us some context to help us understand because being a steward is not something that we really fully understand in our culture. Paul's telling us that we are stewards, we should be stewards, right? But when was the last time you ever asked anybody, hey, what are you gonna be when you grow up? Oh, I'm gonna be a steward. <laughs> I, you know, or hey, when you graduate college, what is it that you're aspiring to? Well, I wanna be a steward. That's not something that we really think about in our, in our culture. We don't think about being a steward. So understanding what a steward is, is important. The uh, uh, concise Ox Oxford English Dictionary has one definition. It's called a person employed to manage another's property, especially a large house or estate. So that would fit in the Greek definition of being a steward or being a manager, someone that takes care of a large estate or a large household. And if you think about that, you know, uh, especially back when stewards were really, you know, uh, something that you saw all the time, over in England especially, even here, you had people that would take care of all of the finances, all of the maintenance, all of the groundskeeping, all of the food preparation, all everything, every single component of what's going on in the house, this steward would take care of that. So you see, this isn't a, a menial position. This is a very important position. This is a very honorable position. I like what C.H. Duncan writes about 
the word steward and being a steward. He writes, more profoundly, it is used of the Christian's responsibility delegated to him under Christ's kingly government of his own house. All things are Christ's and Christians are his executors or stewards. Christians are admitted to the responsibilities of Christ's overruling of his word, world. So now we wanna notice a couple of things here. First, it's delegated to him under Christ's kingly government of his own house. Paul said that, that, that a steward is to be found faithful. He said that we are to be regarded as stewards of the mysteries of God. And here, Duncan is saying that, that, that we, it's been delegated to us. You know what that means, being delegated? That means that you're being, you've been assigned a task, right? You've been assigned a task. And that's what Christ has done for us. Once you have trusted in him, he has assigned you this task. And our position, which is assured and firm in Christ because of what he did, and only because of what he did, we have this privilege, this 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 opportunity to come alongside him as his steward. The other thing that, that we, we have is that he, he wrote is that we had been, a, the Christians are admitted to the responsibilities. Another, another word for that could be granted to the responsibilities. So if we are, if we're responsible, okay, if we're the Lord's steward and we're to manage his household or his large estate, it's, it's important that we understand a little bit of what is Christ, right? What is that large estate? So I'm gonna read something here in just a moment because we wanna to go to scripture to find this out. But I want you to resist right now shutting this down because if I ask you, well, what is Christ? Your, your, your immediate response, well, it's everything. And that's true. But I want us to take a moment, I want us to be diligent, I want us to think intentionally about what this really means and what is really, really is Christ. So let's, let's, look, let's look in Colossians to get a little idea of this. I'm in mean, Colossians 1, chapter 15, excuse me, chapter 1, verses 15 through 20. I'm gonna read this for you. He, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent, or he might be first. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. So when we think about this, all things, I guess in a word, if you thought, well, everything, you'd be correct. But it's whether it's visible or invisible, thrones, dominions, rulers, the scope of God's sovereignty is complete. There's nothing that wasn't created for him by him. Nothing at all. Now I find that encouraging because when I look around, I see all kinds of wild things happening in our culture and in our world. And it can be a, a great way or a great point for me to get really anxious, right? Then I can remember stop and surrender and all the things that Mark taught us. And if we, if we go back to scripture, which is the truth, okay? This isn't an opinion. I didn't read you just my interpretation of this, okay? This is the truth. This is something that you can hang on to with everything you've got. Amen. Thank you. So a couple of other things that I want us to notice in there. He says that in him, all things hold together. Again, as the Lord's steward, we are responsible to manage well the things that he has put in front of us. We are responsible, but we're not responsible for holding all things together. That goes outside the scope of what we've been called to do. And it's important to remember that. We're not responsible for the outcome 
The second part of that phrase is that we are to be stewards of the mysteries of God. Well, now that's, that's important. That's a key point, isn't it? He's saying that we're to be stewards of the mysteries of God, so we better, we better know what the mysteries of God are, shouldn't we? If we're to be stewards of that, then we, we need to know that, right? And, and so, so we're gonna take a look at scripture because it's important. I want us to know what this mystery is. What does that mean? Now, mystery is a secret, right? So you all get to know a secret today. Colossians chapter one, verses 24 through 27. Paul writes, now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. And in my flesh, I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's affliction for the sake of his body. That is the church of which I became a minister, diakonos, according to the stewardship, okonomia. Y'all recognize some of these words? from God that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known, the mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. What is this mystery? Christ in in you, the hope of glory. See, we have a responsibility to steward that message. Paul says that we're required to be found faithful because stewards need to be found faithful as servants of Christ. The hope of glory. Now, is there really much better word than hope? Where can you find true hope? Well, if you're looking to culture for hope, you're gonna come up empty handed. Solomon wrote about this, right? If you reach out for any other place for hope, you're gonna come up disappointed and discouraged. If you reach into yourself, if you start trying to be the one that is in control, if you're trying to control the outcome, you're only gonna become frustrated, disappointed, and discouraged because you're going outside of your mandate. It's in him all things hold together, not in you, not in me. As his stewards, we need to know that. But how do we do that? Doesn't that sound somewhat ominous? How do we do that? How do we become a servant of Christ, the Lord's steward? That's, I, that's a... That's a good question. I'm glad I asked that question. <laughs> First, you cannot be a servant of Christ or the Lord's steward unless you have trusted in him and what he did on the cross. You can't. You have to know, we all have to know that we're not perfect, that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All of us, every single one of us have sinned, Romans 3.23. We need to understand the truth that the wages for those sins is death, eternal separation from Christ. That's the truth, but The free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, Romans 6, 23. In order to be saved and become the Lord's steward, one must be born again or he cannot see the kingdom of God, John 3, 3. And I wanna be clear, there is no other way. There is a, no other method. There's nothing that you can do. There's nothing that you can be taught there's nothing that you can work towards, no matter what anybody else says. If anybody gives you any other gospel except for what you find in here, then it is a lie, okay? There's no other way, no other way. Jesus said in John 14, six, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. No one comes to the Father except through Christ. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved, Romans 10, 9. 
Now here's some more good news. Jesus died for all that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised, 2 Corinthians 5, 15. The most important thing in your life ever is Christ and his free gift. As you reflect, and this is the time of the year that we all reflect, this is, we're coming up on a new year. I tried to push it off a little bit quicker earlier today, but it's a, it's a, it is an appropriate time for us to reflect. And Lord willing, we're gonna have another year, right? Lord willing, we will. So it's, it's also an appropriate time to think forward a little bit. And as we reflect, what position have we taken? What position did I take? I know that you know, every time that I teach, you know, God reveals places in my life that needs to be attended to. But what position have you taken? Have you taken the position of the king? The master? Have you made yourself responsible for something that is Christ's? Or have you taken the position of a steward? An honorable position that because of what he did, you could be granted into that. Paul says in Ephesians chapter two, verses eight through nine, he says, for by grace you are saved through faith, not of works, lest anyone should boast. That is important, not of works, lest anyone should boast. That means that no matter how bad you've acted in your past, no matter how many sins, you could not have ever done anything immoral enough not to be saved by Christ. Nothing. On the other side of that, there is nothing that you can do good enough to save yourself. It's by grace, through faith, not of works. Now, Mark would say, that deserves an amen. <laughs> so so it, 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 we're, we're ministers. We're ministers, diakonos. We're ambassadors for Christ. We have a responsibility to take and steward the mysteries of God. But if you haven't done that yourself, if you haven't done that yourself, you're missing the boat. Now I purposely read scripture for you directly regarding that so that it would be clear and it's important as stewards, as the Lord's steward, that you know where your strength comes from, where your hope comes from. Because remember, the mystery is Christ in you, the glory, and it can't be found anywhere else. It can't be found anywhere else. There's one other thing that I, I, I just gotta say. It, it's, we have free will. We have the ability to choose. Sadly, we see the abuse of free will all around us. We have to suffer the consequences of free, bill, uh, free will since the very beginning. That's, that's why we have evil in this world. You have a choice to make, right? God's not gonna force you into anything. Let's just make sure that we understand what that choice is that we're making. In Luke eleven twenty three 23 and Matthew 12, 30, Jesus says, whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. We're going to serve something. We're going to serve something. Don't be, don't be deceived by the enemy that's the father of lies. Don't be deceived into thinking, well, this Christian life is too constraining because prior to trust in Christ, prior to your salvation, the word tells us that you're a slave to sin. You want freedom? Then trust in Christ. That's where freedom is. See, Mark started his three-week thing saying, hey, listen, true peace is found in the Prince of Peace. The enemy of this world, the enemy of you and I, the one that hates us with a purity of hatred will never fully understand, will do anything he can, promise anything he can to get you off base. Hey, 
You're the master of your destiny. You don't need to be a steward. You need to be the master. You need to be the one making all the choices. And boy, that really works well until it doesn't work out and we have no power to change anything. And then suddenly we're like, wait a minute, how did all this happen? Where do I go? You go to Christ. That's where you go. Finally, being the Lord's steward is a lifestyle. It's a lifestyle that proclaims the truth of Christ to the world. It's a lifestyle of evangelism. Paul said that we're to be stewards of the mysteries of God, which is Christ in you. And that should be a lifestyle. I asked you a little while ago, how does one regard someone else? How do you know who they are and what they're about? First Peter tells us to always be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. That word defense is, is translated as apologia. It's the word that we get apologetics from. It, it's it's, it, it's, it's what, you, what you use to defend your faith. The, the traditional sense of apologetics is where you would take scripture, and this is very appropriate, don't misunderstand me, and you would make an argument. If someone said, no, there is another way, you would go back using scripture to say, no, there is no other way. And that's important. Jesus tells us to abide in his word. He also tells us to study the, and examine the scriptures to see if these things are true. That is important. You need to dive into the word of God. That is our authority. That is where he came and told us about himself. There's another concept that I want to introduce to today that, that Dr. David Wheeler, he was one of my professors, he was the evangelism professor at Liberty, and he wrote an article called Incarnational Apologetics. And I want to read what he defined incarnational apologetics as. He writes, Incarnational apologetics is the representative public and private lifestyle of a Christian that validates to the world the absolute truths of the Bible. It should be the natural resort, or excuse me, result of a born again experience and is communicated to the world through both actions and attitudes of Christians as they consistently live out the tenets of their faith in community with both the redeemed and the unredeemed. As the Lord's stewards, what does this look like in our life? If we believe what he's saying in his word, and we don't live that way, then we're hypocrites. If we go to tell somebody, listen, you can have hope, you can have life, and you can do it in Christ, it's the most important thing in the world, and yet we don't live that way, what are we really saying? Lifestyle, it's our responsibility. Not for the outcome, but to act in obedience, because the third act, you know, third letter was obedience in that STOP acronym, wasn't it? So, the people that go to Digging Deeper know that I like to, I like to say, okay, now how does this play out in your life? Because, y'all, if we, if we just take this and it's just an academic pursuit, then it's just words on a page and it doesn't mean anything. If it's just an academic pursuit, oh great, well I learned that apologia is translated as defense, it's an argument, I learned about diakonos, I learned about these cool words in Greek. Doesn't mean anything. So what would a lifestyle, what would a being the Lord's steward look like in your life? Well what about when I go home? What about the way I love my wife? Do I love her the way Christ loves the church? Or do I love her selfishly? What about wives? Are you being submissive and respectful? What about how we parent? Are we raising them up in the way they should go? None of this is perfection here. I'm not talking about that. You know, as parents, as, as people of faith, you know, we want people to, to catch on to this kind of stuff. How am I supposed to lead my wife? How is she supposed to be comfortable with trusting me by being respectful and submissive if she doesn't see me submitting to the word of God, if she doesn't see me being obedient to the word? How are we supposed to expect our children to, to come alongside? Oh no, you need to obey, you need to obey, but yet we, we live a lifestyle that is not 
and congruent with what we, what we read about in the word of God. Not perfect lives. If we could be perfect, Jesus wouldn't have had to come. How about how I love my neighbor? It's one of the things that struck me here recently. I don't really know my neighbors that much. You know, I, I walk in there, I drive, I go home, and, and I don't really engage with them. But that's not, that's not what Christ told me to do, was it? He told me that I was supposed to take the word out to my neighborhood, where I work, around, and to the ends of the world. I'm supposed to be proclaiming his love, his truth, into a broken world. I'm his ambassador, right? How do you love your neighbor? How do you treat those that mistreat you? How do you drive your car? Hmm. <laughs> I almost didn't write that one down. <laughs> it's a lifestyle. It's a lifestyle that doesn't have to be perfect. He didn't ask us to be perfect. That'd be outside of our abilities. It's a lifestyle of dependency on him. The wonderful thing is, is that he told his disciples, now you, look, I'm gonna send you out there. You're gonna do all kinds of things, but don't go anywhere yet. Wait, and I'm gonna send you a helper. Then you're gonna have the power you need to go and do what you need. Not because of what you're capable of, but what I'm capable of in you. If you've trusted in Christ as your savior, if you've trusted in what he's done for you on the cross, then you have the power of God living in you. You have the Holy Spirit living in you. Live a lifestyle that reflects that. You can, you can hang on to that and you can trust that. Joshua 24, he says, uh, he asks this question, or he makes a statement actually. He says, choose today whom you will serve. As for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. So that's what I'm gonna ask you. Choose today whom you're going to serve. Choose today, don't put it off. I know we're all looking forward to the new year, but none of us are guaranteed that new year. You have an unbelievable opportunity. You have been given the privilege of being co-heirs with Christ. You have been given the privilege to be called a child of God if you've trusted in him. He could have done it any way he wanted to. He's God, but he chose you and me. It's not some menial position to be the Lord's steward. It's a position of honor that is based in Christ because it's all about him. All right, let's pray. Father, Lord, thank you so much for your grace and your mercy, Lord. Thank you so much that we don't have to be perfect, Lord. Thank you that it's all about you, Lord. Thank you for your word. Thank you for loving us so much, Lord. Thank you for all the many, many things that you've done for us, but most of all for coming and dying for us, Lord. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit, that your Holy Spirit would reach out to us, Father. Show us ways that we can live for you, Father. Help us to remember that it's all about you and it's your strength and it's your might and it's you. Lord, help us to remember that we're not responsible for the outcome, Father, and help us to have the clarity to trust you and to obey you, to surrender to you, to trust and praise you, Father. Thank you so much for your love and your mercy. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for you, In Jesus' name, amen.